So we are now into session two of the 2023 free Zoom sessions. Um, the first one was very much around the basics of the planning, which garlic you're going to grow for your matching your climate, um, certainly which storage attributes you're looking for, what culinary attributes, particularly if you've got any cultural attributes, and then planning how many do you need um, and you know what area would you need for planting. So that's really the first session over and done with. That this next session goes into the really practical side. So we're going to go into pre-planting treatments. We're going to go into how to plant in depth, looking at your post-planting treatments and, and applications, and then mulching. And the third session is going to go into that really active growing stage, fertilizing, watering, scaping, harvesting, curing, storage. So three really modular units. You can re-watch these at any time that you want. But let's go ahead and get our sessions in. Now, if you do happen to have any questions, I've got the chat box listed up here at the moment. Um, and I can, at the end of this, we're gonna save all the questions to the end. And at the end, then we can go through those questions and I'll read through them. If anything has been, hasn't been answered, I'll open up to free questions at the end of it so that you can unmute yourself and just ask live if you'd like that. But very quickly, if you hadn't joined me for the first one, this is a little bit about me. Um, I've been growing garlic for 20 years. 10 years of that's been broad acre production of about 25 tonnes. Um, the last 11 years has been specifically focused on seed production, which is a very different method and a much higher quality standard and certainly requires you to do a lot more management practices and understanding of all of the pe pest and disease uh, diseases that are relevant as well as their life cycle impacts and how to actually identify them and also treat them. I've done two guides in response to a lot of what I've seen for questions that are being asked for both my commercial garlic growers and for the public. Um, and certainly the first session, we really drew a lot from the culinary culture and climate, which is all about the different garlic groups and where they've evolved and their storage and their culinary requirements and what they look like as well. Um, and the other one was the pest and diseases because I found that there was a lot of visual information that was missing particularly for commercial growers and home growers about what these diseases look like and particularly through the life cycle and their level of infection so that's something that was just released last year and yes it does say volume one because unfortunately <laughs> there are quite a lot of diseases and pests for garlic so this was certainly the highest priority ones that I felt that need to come out of that. Um, most of this in fact is just an overview of me but really the main part is that I've been growing garlic for a long time, all of the different garlic groups um, in at least three different states in Australia. Um, and I've been a professional consultant for about 10 years. And that means garlic growers all over Australia and some places internationally. Um, I have been helping them. So different garlic groups in different climates, definitely in different growing conditions. And that's really helped diversity of behaviours but also how different pests and diseases are affecting them. And that's become very invaluable, I think, in terms of my own focus on seed growing skills and the standards I maintain. So let's not dwell too much on that. Oh, this is Zoom session two, not one. Beg my pardon for using the same template. Um, we are going to focus a bit about pests and diseases. You can't go into talking about pretreatments without understanding what we're doing and why we're doing them. Um, and the fact is that garlic accumulates diseases, and that's a fact that we can't avoid. And it's why the seed quality standards are actually so important for us. Um, Pre-planting treatments, we're going to go through some three basic ones that I would recommend. Two of them, I think, are absolutely vital. Um, and then we're going to go through planting and then post-planting applications, and which differs from pre-planting treatments. And then finally, the easy one, which is mulching. So let's grab into it. So of all of the annual crops, and I'm being very specific there, annual crops typically have the most level of diseases because you're planting, growing, harvesting. Of all of the annual crops, garlic bulbs are the most vulnerable to diseases, and there's a pretty good list of practical reasons why they are. Um, garlic uh, is one of, one of the very few annual crops that is using vegetative reproduction, and that means we're using cloves from a saved bulb. We're not actually using true seed, which is what actually filters a lot of the disease out of the other crops. So a true seed that you're planting each year has that seed saving hybridization vigor, and it actually filters diseases. In our vegetative reproduction, we're unfor unfortunately carrying forward diseases out of the planting stock. 
It's also that the bulb is being produced below the soil line, onion sit on top. Most of our fruit and vegetables come above the ground. There are a few things of tubers that will grow beneath the ground. Potatoes are the ones that are most similar to garlic in terms of the vulnerabilities of below ground growing, although potatoes have very much developed a clean seed system of production to avoid those types of diseases being transmitted. It's a really long growing crop. In fact, it's the longest growing annual crop, six to nine months in the ground. And it's a winter crop, which is the hardest season to be able to survive through. It's why onions have become spring planted and not autumn planted in the commercial world. We're getting significant changes of our seasons. So we're getting unstable spring and summer conditions with more rainfall during the bulbing period. And that's introducing higher risks of different diseases. And the fact is that with this vegetative reproduction, we are accumulating pests and diseases. So our cloves are infected with diseases and pests. Our soils are infected with just naturally occurring diseases, as well as accumulated diseases from previous seasons. We've got other crops that share common diseases with garlic. So if you're growing other crops, even in your backyard garden, that can. And of course, if you're on a natural water source, so not mains water, a natural water source, so a dam or a bore or creek water or spring water, it can actually be transferring diseases into your crops as well. So these infected cloves uh, can transfer disease and pests into new planting soils. And that's our main issue is to try and avoid soil infection with these common and serious diseases so that we really have planting healthy stock in healthy soil and we're avoiding that type of disease accumulation that can happen in the soils. There are the reality is that there are very few in-field curative treatments. Um, and that really means that we have to be very careful with the quality of seed stock that we plant. Um, and it also means that we have to be incredibly careful with how we manage that planting pre-treatment programs, planting and then monitoring the health of our stock. Um, and look, more diseases develop during the, the, the curing and the storage stage. So poor curing conditions can really allow mold infestations to occur and progress other diseases that are already present. And even storage diseases can really, again, impact that. This is the longest storing annual crop that there is. It's one of the benefits of it, but it's also some of the impacts and the risks. So there's a lot of reasons why garlic can do. And despite everybody wanting to promote on all of the wonderful you know, um, gardening shows that it's one of the easiest crops. In fact, it's one of the crops that accumulate diseases and the more serious diseases really quickly and can infect other soils as well. Let's have a look at those because part of our pre-planting treatments is about understanding what are the most common and serious diseases. With garlic, we're always going to be looking at fungal diseases. And historically, that's been the primary issue that we've had when we had stable seasonal weathers. Fungal related to the excess water conditions or the uh, high rainfall and overcast conditions and typically pests. So in those warmer climates, we would have a lot of mites, aphids, thrips, um, and mites beneath the soil lines. But recently with our really unstable weather conditions, we're getting a lot more bacterial diseases that we've never seen before in, in, in garlic. And those bacterial diseases are really serious and they have no chemical or infield treatment or cures at all. So there is no cures for virus, which is the last one that we would typically have. And there's no cures for bacterial disease. We have limited control over fungal diseases and pests. And that's why we do a lot of preventative and protective treatments of our growing crops to prevent that infection or prevent the infestation. But they're the sort of the spectrum of what we're looking for when we're thinking about what we need to protect or pre-treat our garlic with. And of those, we typically have you know, some things that we need to think about in addition to that. So why, and this is why most expert seed growers, and I'll include myself of that, I'm always going to choose the best planting stock. And most of us would have, and I have a very specific quality grading system for both growing plants as well as bulb stock. And it's because our best plants have the least amount of disease in them. And that means that we're carrying forward really strong and vigorous plants with very little clinically impacting diseases. So that's our main issue is that our bulbs are going to accumulate that disease and those pest infestations and pass it on. But our other main issue is that we want to think about how we pre-treat our cloves because some of the most effective treatments are done before we put them in the ground. Um, and this treatment is really for the external pests and diseases on the clove skins and clove skin surface. 
It's definitely not going to cure internal, what we call internal tissue diseases or internal shoot diseases. But part of that means that when we're growing that plant out, poor nutrition, which is plant stress, can often leave that plant very vulnerable to diseases, just like a human being with malnutrition is more susceptible to different diseases than a really healthy person is. We'll often talk about roguing in the field, and that means if there's something that has been impacted and got through the system, we would be wanting to pull that plant out to avoid further infection of surrounding neighbours or to soils, and that's part of our quality control system. We need to monitor and manage plant nutrition, which is what we're talking about, and ensure we've got free draining soils. Saturated soils with garlic particularly is one of the major causes of disease, both root disease, basal plate disease, bulb disease, leaf diseases. And we need to make sure that we're not transferring disease um, from one plant to another or from one area of planting to another. So all of these things we're considering when we're you know, professional growers and particularly when we're thinking as master or even home growers, you know, how do I actually avoid these issues so that I'm really maintaining the health of my garlic seed and that I'm selecting the right garlic seed to be able to go forward. And pre-planting treatments is one of the major things that we use to be able to ensure that we've got minimal amount of transfer into that planting stock. So what can pre-treatments fix? It can't fix everything. <laughs> so it's minor in external infections. And that means if you've got tiny amounts of a fusarium pock on the clove and it's only very shallow, you can treat that. Minor infestations, or so certainly infestations of any type we can treat with mites um, and limited internal infestations. So that's a, a bloat nematode we're going to talk about. So the primary runs that we're interested in is going to be the bulb mites and the rhizoglyphus eggs. Um, you may, won't see these. These are microscopic little tiny mites. This is a photograph of them underneath the microscope. On the clove, you'll often see this slightly tanned or dehydrated clove. You might even see it with these little tiny crystalline structures. But these mites go out with a planted clove. They'll climb up the tissue on the leaf. They'll climb down into the forming bulb. And they're one of the major reasons that the storage of your bulb is really reduced. You might see a clove that starts to go dehydrated and desiccated and then the whole bulb will start to desiccate and that's really because primarily of a, a level of mites. The other mites that we really want to get rid of are the rhizoglyphus mites and they're a much bigger mite that isn't quite visible by the eyes. You can sort of see little white dots, pearl-like dots sort of running around um, but they're a lovely white mite with these purple brown legs um, very easily visible underneath the microscope, but very damaging, really damaging to roots, really damaging to the basal plate, can get up into the bulb, and that wound that they create becomes an infection source for almost anything else that's in the soil. It really compromises that plant and that bulb completely. So these are two mites that we absolutely want to control. The other ones is any type of spores that come from fungal infection. So garlic rust is really a field infection. It will rarely get transferred unless you don't sterilise or pre-treat for that clove, just in case there's a spore on the outside. It's not an internal infection. But there are other spores of penicillium or aspergillus niger or even embolesia that are external spores that we really want to neutralise so that we're not transferring those through into the next field. There's penicillium. It often comes in different colours, so you'll see different spots in there. The clove isn't compromised. It could be a surface. Some penicilliums can be an internal disease. And you can see the amount of damage that that transfer to the field can do in terms of the necrotic impact on that young seedling that's trying to come through. That's a penicillium infection that's made it out into the field. Bloat nematode is very common over in Northern America, and it has been common in Canada. I only had three recorded instances in Australia, although it's probably underreported because it's not tested frequently. But this is a scary one. And it's a scary one because it becomes subclinical in terms of very minor um, apparent type of impact on the plant um, until and it accumulates up to three years, which means you're infecting all of those different areas that you're planting in. And then once it gets to a level of infection, it will literally decimate that crop incredibly quickly. So we definitely don't want to allow this to get to a point of impacting any of our seed stock at all. And look, the bacterial diseases, whilst there's been no evidentiary cure for them, I've been doing some trialling with 
bleach why you've seen in my 2023 growing guide i've used bleach specifically and we're going to go through that because it, it it appears and i'm still getting the pathology testing being done working with a new south wales bacteriologist which is wonderful to be able to determine that these blight diseases are being transferred to clove skin or clove tissue surface and that it's not an internal disease so that if we're able to sterilize that external surface we may be able to avoid the transfer of these two particular diseases going out into the field. It's the only time we can treat it, but it's an incredibly important time to be able to avoid those. Um, they do not cure diseases, and these are the pre-planting treatments. They don't cure diseases that are internal clove tissue diseases. So there are some diseases that are right at the heart of that clove tissue or in the growing shoot, and none of these type of external peripheral treatments or slightly penetrative treatments are going to really cure an internal disease. So they're very good for a lot of things. They're not going to cure everything. So this is all about seed management and quality management as well. So just to differentiate, I do recommend pretreatments, but the pretreatments I'm recommending are all about managing those pest infestations and external diseases. I don't recommend the actual other treatments that many people talk about, which is focused on germination. And you'll often hear about people talking about 24-hour sea cell soaks with a little bit of bicarb soda in them. When I did a lot of commercial um, broadacre production and I was certified organic, I did actually use the sea cell soaks for quite a long time. And I did a lot of studies on them. Um, they actually aren't effective. And this bicarb soda is supposed to be a fungicide. It's not a very effective fungicide. So it's not actually going to do any type of pest or disease um, sterilization. Uh, it can contribute to a high level of fusarium. That's the trials that I ran for nearly 10 years that showed that. Uh, it means that the clove skin gets loosened and we end up with the nutrient, which is the sea cell, a very potent nutrient sitting between the clove skin and the clove tissue trapped in there, becomes a really good pocket for those soil bacteria and fungal diseases to get in. And we found that it could contribute to a high level of penicillium and damping off diseases. Now, that was my commercial finding in Broadacre. It's not going to be everybody's because I'm dealing with very different conditions in Broadacre. But I do recommend sea soil soaks for germination, but applied afterwards, not before. Um, and that's a really important differentiation to be able to make sure that we're not loosening that clove skin that acts as a really important protector of the clove itself. So what are some of these? You've seen on my growing guide, I'm talking about hospital grade bleach this year, and I'm not trying to make it too complex. Hospital grade bleach is by definition 42 grams per liter of sodium hypochlorite. And I just wanna explain the functioning of this. This is what the pathology labs use to actually sterilize the surface of their tissue before they do their pathology testing and culturing. Um, so it's a very common product that's being used. I know that we call it hospital grade bleach, but it's because it's so effective against fungal bacterial and some viruses. Now in that um, bleach grade, I would be using a full strength if there's no shoot and no roots showing, knowing that that living organic tissue is very vulnerable to bleach, which is why we would do this when it's two thirds of the way up the, the, the shoot is two thirds of the way up the clove. So we soak for three minutes in undiluted bleach and then we thoroughly rinse afterwards. We don't want to leave the bleach on. It has, does have a residual degradation effect, but we really want to have that sterilization effect. And particularly bleach is very effective against bacteria. And that's really what we're chasing at this moment is those two bacterial bleaches that I think, I'm sorry, leaf blights that I think actually could be affected. I've done two trials on this and it looks very, very good. Um, if you do actually have some shooting roots, unfortunately, you cannot use undiluted bleach, so you won't get the level of effectiveness. But if you dilute it one to three, so one part bleach to three parts water, and then again rinse for three minutes or, or soak for three minutes and then rinse afterwards, you will get some level of effectiveness, which is certainly going to be better than any of the bicarb soda that you could use. So this treatment, even though it's only for three minutes, its primary purpose is to really hit back that bacterial blight disease that we we're talking about and has been present and growing in incidence in the last three years. It will actually have some benefit on external viruses on the clove skin. It'll have minor clove skin and tissue fungal disease benefit because it's only in there for three minutes. So it hasn't been able to penetrate through that clove skin to the clove tissue. 
and it will have some impact on the surface mites and their eggs. But mites bury in the clove tissue, and so the three minutes isn't enough to really kill off those mites. But it's a really good starting one to really get that general treatment to be able to clean off anything that could be infecting. I always follow up, and this is me personally, so I'm sharing this with you, and it's not on the growing guide, but I always follow up with what I call my mite and surface fungal treatment, which is using 2% of neem oil and 2% of natural soap in water soaked for 24 hours. Now, neem oil is an incredibly effective insecticide, a natural insecticide, and that 24 hours of exposure will penetrate into that clove tissue to where all of those mites are going to be and destroy their eggs, which is fantastic. And the secondary benefit of the neem oil is that it's going to actually um, impact any fungal diseases of that surface. And where we've only had three minutes of exposure in a bleach, this 24 hours again allows it to penetrate through the clove skin, penetrate into that clove tissue um, and be able to really affect those um, pests and diseases inside. Now, I've also been using another type of organic product called wood vinegar. Um, it's the uh, basically the condensed smoke that's given off biochar. And it's I'm finding, and there's been research on finding that it's also very effective as a natural fungicide. So you could pop in another 2% of your wood vinegar into that 24-hour soak. And you've really got a good pest and fungal treatment here. Here you've got the bacterial, here you've got your fungal and your pest treatments. And that's really what we're looking for is to really knock back as much as we can, anything on that clove skin surface, on the, on the clove skin surface, the clove tissue surface, and particularly around that basal plate area where the scar tissue is that's come off its parent, where the roots are going to penetrate. This penetrating type of treatment is really good for being able to get into that. And because we're not rinsing and because it's been in there for 24 hours, it does have some residual benefit once it's been planted to really help that plant to be able to put out really clean roots and unaffected roots in there. Just remembering that the main issue with planting cloves is that that clove remnant that's left over after the tissue or the shoot comes out, it's that clove tissue that often contains all of those diseases. And as that clove tissue then degrades into the soil immediately around the root zone, it's actually infecting the soil and it's infecting the plant. <laughs> so that's really the infectious source of our poor plant is actually the, the degrading clove remnant that is actually sitting immediately in that root zone of that germinating root. Now, they're the two home treatments that I think are absolutely fabulous. If you were what I call a semi-commercial um, grower, then you might like to think about treating for bloat nematode because it is a disease we, or pest we would never want our garlic to be infected with. Uh, we know it's been in South Australia. We know there's been a test example up in northern Tasmania and there's been a couple identified in Victoria and New South Wales. So it is out there. I think it's under-tested. Although one of our saving graces was to date, we had nothing that was recognised to be effective against the bloat nematode in any field treatments at all. And recent studies, and particularly over in Northern America and Canada, where they had been decimated by the bloat nematode, had found that a fungicide called fluoropyram, uh, fluoropyram has actually been very effective against fully killing the bloat nematode in a four-hour soak in the clove, in that uh, fluoropyram. Now, that's a commercial product. It's in a product called Vellum Prime, um, and we do have access to that in Australia or an equivalent product in Australia. So, but it would require, it's very expensive and you certainly need to have access to, to it through the commercial rural supply companies. But bloat nematode is something that is, uh, should be tested more frequently for. And certainly we now have an effective pre-planting treatment, but it doesn't actually kill all of the nematodes in the field, which could reinfect a plant that had already been treated. For just to let you know, for any other commercial growers that we do out there, we really monitor our crops and that's what we have to do. So we monitor our plant and diseases. It means that we have to put in our samples through pathology laboratories, confirm what we're seeing in there. When we get that confirmation, we need to be able to separate out the infected planting stock. We need to pre-treat for anything that we can. And then we have to include our in-field treatments for our following seasons to really follow up on anything that we find. I know home growers don't have that ability to be able to do that level of testing. It's very expensive. 
And that's why maintaining really good seed stock or having access to a really good seed seller is really important to make sure you've got good stock. Now, what does that look like? This is a photograph of two years ago. You know, I'm sitting here eating my crooked tree hazelnuts while I'm cracking garlic and getting ready to plant. Um, I'm going through all of my planting bulbs and testing and looking at all of the quality of my cloves. And I'm certainly seed grading them in size. So I'm actually putting out my mediums, large, extra larges, putting out my smalls. Smalls don't create big bulbs. So smalls do not get planted for me. And then after I've actually put them out and canted them out, I actually have a treatment program. So here's my would have been at that stage, my vodka soak, because it was two years ago, and that's going to become a bleach soak now for everything. And then after they come out of that bleach soak, then they'll go into a great big tub. And look, I use you know laundry nets to actually tie up my clothes um, because it just allows me to put them into the 24-hour neem oil soak and um, keep them out with all of their signs so I know what they are. So, you know, you don't have to have swanky looking equipment. It's just about the process to follow and making sure that you're using that. And you will find if you're using your own seed stock that you will have a very healthy plant coming out of that in its noticeably healthier germination and growth in its first six to eight weeks, having done the pre-treatments on that. When we get into planting, and I'm going to differentiate raised bed planting from in-ground planting. Um, these are my what I call my short beds, which are for my Mediterraneans that enjoy a warmer, drier soil. And you can either use a planting frame, which I use, or a dibbler, which I no longer use. A planting frame is just easy for me because it means if I've got anybody working with me, you plant in the hole. You know, it's a really simple one. <laughs> it's already been mapped out where you're going to plant. You just plant in the middle of the hole and that guarantees the spacing. Um, but if you were doing that, and this was done on the 15 by 15 spacing, but I'm actually recommending to home growers that you use a 20 by 20. And I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. Um, as a home grower, I want you to be able to get the biggest bulbs and the healthiest plants. And the way to do that is to make sure that you've got the least amount of pest and disease pressure. And pest and disease pressure means that you want to have a really healthy plant, so maximum sunlight. So there's no competition from surrounding plants that could create shading and then that water on leaf and the leaf diseases. Uh, we want to make sure that you've got maximum root mass with no competition. So we don't want the plants fighting for nutrition, which could mean disease or stress, nutrient stress, which could open it up to make it vulnerable to diseases. And we want that air ventilation around the plant because wet leaves does equal pest and disease pressure. So the faster we can dry those leaves off from morning condensation or from rainfalls, the better and the healthier it's going to be. So for a home grower where you are in the non-commercial range, certainly would recommend 20 by 20 in terms of the close spacing. Planting depth is always something interesting that people ask because it's not about the depth of what you plant. It's how big the clove is before you plant it. Um, some cloves can be really short and only you know, 20 mil high and some cloves can be really long and they could be nearly 35 mil long cloves. So it's really about having two centimetres above the clove tip and that's the soil to keep that clove down in the ground with the weight of that so a clove does not sort of stand up on its roots and try and push out. And that two centimetres means that that stem where the bulb is going to develop is going to be developing below the soil line, which is where we get out of this peak heat of scorch. Um, and it means that we're going to keep that bulb healthier and cooler in the ground there. I just use my full finger mitt because that technically is actually six and a half centimetres. And so when I poke it straight in the ground, which you can see me doing, the hole that I've left with my finger is actually deep enough for all of my cloves to then go into. And then I just close the, the hole on top, move the soil over, and then it's finished. So it's a pretty simple thing for me. If your soil is open enough, I just push the clove down in there. Obviously, you can see tip up, which is where the shoot's going to come out, basal plate down, which is where the roots are going to come out. And I can just push that straight down. And I know that when it's gone down to the top of my finger, that I've actually gone down deep enough to have two centimetres above the roots, above the, the tip of the clove. If you're not growing in raised beds and you're growing what we call in ground, um, <laughs> we really with garlic have to use what's called ridged planting mounds. You'll often see these types of photographs where we're creating a furrow with a tool 
and then we're putting the clove into the furrow and closing it up. So that clove is now in what we call below ground level, saturation level. And with garlic, that's an incredibly risky business because it absolutely hates water. So you either have to create a planting ridge where the clove is above that saturated ground level. And if you're in a really wet rainfall area, creating really lovely ridged mounds is really important. Um, we really want to keep that clove about 15 centimetres above the main saturated ground level. And I would say the warmer you are, the probably the less rainfall you're going to have around bulbing and you might be safe to have it slightly lower. But if you're in a really high rainfall area, the higher you can have it in ridging, the healthier that plant's going to be and the healthier the bulb is going to be as well. So in-ground planting should be ridged or mounded planting, never in-ground for furrows because you will have a lot of basal plate and bulb diseases because of that exposure to saturated ground levels during high rainfall periods. Let's talk about post-planting. You can see that my pre-planting was all about pest and disease management and control as much as I can before I get it into the ground. But post-planting for me is all about germination and soil inoculation. So I've already done and cleansed the clove. It's as clean as it can be. It's gonna get as much healthy nutrition as it can out of the soil but I do want it to germinate quickly and I do want it to be healthy. And the way to get that faster germination is because you can make sure you're planting the right garlic group at the right time. That shoot should be two thirds of the way up the clove. You should saturate your soils. That's the only time I'll use the word saturate is when we're actually planting the clove because that full moisture exposure really does help that clove to germinate with the roots first. It should produce roots before it produces shoots. Um, and certainly I use a trichoderma, which is a biological organism which actually stimulates rooting and actually stimulates healthy roots. So that first emergence of roots, it's a pathogen suppressor, it's a pathogen targeter, particularly fungal pathogens. So it has that dual benefit of promoting growth, promoting healthy roots and suppressing a lot of fungal pathogens. So I use those as part of my post-planting germination and treatments. And I'll certainly put out a sea salt treatment, which is what that sea salt pre-planting soak was that other people are doing. I'm doing that after I've planted the cloves. And that way it's still using that hormone, that natural hormone, which is a rooting hormone, to actually help that plant to germinate. And roots first and shoots second. That's really what we want with garlic. I'll also inoculate it with the beneficials and biocontrols. That's me. So I use some mycorrhizal, some nematophagous fungi, some of the cordyceps, which is about soil insects and the trichodermas. And that's just giving a general treatment about targeting things that aren't so beneficial. And then I'll actually put in some beneficial organisms that I use right throughout the year. And that's to boost the nutrient cycling and the disease suppressive capabilities of the soil. Now, if you're making a really good home compost, and I mean a really lovely home compost, not the ones that you buy in the bag in the stores, then your lovely home compost is going to have a lot of these organisms already in it. So if you're using your home compost, you're already inoculating your soils. Um, if you're not, a lot of the new drug products, in fact, I can't think of one of the new drug products that doesn't, particularly their pelletized products have all been inoculated with beneficial organisms. That's a really good way of getting some of those good guys back into your soils as well. So that's planting, post-planting, difference between pre-planting, I'm treating for pest and disease, and then post-planting, I'm then moistening the soils and then helping to stimulate that plant to be able to produce great roots in there. I particularly, as I said, don't like to do the pre-planting to get root nodules. You'll often see a lot of those YouTube videos that are showing, you know, that you can cut the tops off the garlic bulbs and actually get those roots growing in a glass of water. That is just absolutely not the right way to go. Garlic's roots are so fragile and actually so not fibrous they're so they're so delicate that if you were to break or knock those as you're putting them into the soils then that's an infection site for disease to be able to penetrate and the second thing this often has been found with people who thought they could transplant garlic in a transplanter rather than direct planting is that you'll actually get roots tied up they don't spread out and they don't actually grow deep and garlic can produce incredibly deep you know, 40 to 50 centimeters worth of deep soils and roots and it's that wonderful root mass that actually really you know, vigorously 
helps that plant to grow. So transplanted garlic is not great for roots. Um, and certainly if you're trying to pre-develop roots with those soaks before you plant, any type of damage, which is a wound, becomes a site for infection, which is something we don't want to invite in our garlic. Once we've got the planted, um, I it's talking about mulching. I always mulch. It's just one of my things I do. I don't wait for the actual shoot to come up. I mulch immediately. I use an organic cane sugar mulch and I use three centimetres of it. Um, it's I find the best mulch that I've ever used and because it doesn't hold water, um, it actually has a wonderful ability to keep the soil dry, um, to allow the moisture in the soil to be able to evaporate. It doesn't become sodden and wet around the garlic neck at all. Um, and it does suppress weed and it's a long lasting mulch. So if there is something that I find that's really beneficial, I'm always going to recommend the cane sugar mulch because of that. Um, and I know, I know that pea and cereal is a really great one, particularly pea for, for nitrogens. I just find that pea straw is fantastic for spring and summer crops because it has high nitrogens. Um, it's not great, so great for winter crops because we really don't want that nitrogen release during our dormant periods of, of or our slower growing periods over winter. So if I could recommend it, I would de definitely talk about an organic cane sugar mulch. I th that's it for session two. Just to remind us that session three is going to be focusing on the last stages so winter management by climate, fertilising, watering, scaping, harvesting, curing and storage. So with the end of session two, um, I'm going to go through the chat and see if we've got any questions that I can answer. So uh, let me just do that. I'm going to skip out of this. Go back into viewing with everybody. So hi, everybody. And let me go through the chats and see what we've got. So I've got Tira saying mulching, if we usually have a lot of rain during winter, should we mulch? Look, I think it's about the weed pressure that you have. Uh, if you could avoid mulching um, before spring comes in, I would do it because high rainfalls equal really wet soils and some mulches can really hold that water, uh, that water in the soil. Um, but if you have, for me, I have 765 beds, <laughs> you know, raised beds. Um, I have to have weed suppression from when I plant. I can't afford to do a huge amount of weed, weeding and I already do three cycles of weeding. I, that's why I use the cane sugar mulch because again, it doesn't hold water. It doesn't keep the soil overly wet and I still get my weed suppression from that. So is it better to not have mulch during winter? Sure, it's definitely better not to have mulch during winter but there's gonna be a lot more time spent on mulching in spring because now you've got all the plants growing up and you've got a mulch in between them. Um, and that takes a lot more time. So that's, I think a personal choice, but you can use cane sugar mulch without any issues on that. Can rust be passed on from seed garlic to new plants? Uh, yes, it can. So if you do not sterilize, your seed and if you had rust in the uh, previous seasons or if you had rust on the plants from the season you harvest your stock in, those rust spores will be all over that plant tissue, all over that bulb tissue. They're microscopic, it's, it's, you can see it under a microscope, but they're there. And it's one of the reasons because when we're cracking the garlic open, it's not that the cloves or the spores will be inside, it's that when we've got those cloves open, those spores are all in the air and they're settling on the cloves and they're gonna be transplanted out very likely it'll be transplanted out. The major issue with garlic rust is actually soil infection from previous seasons. And it's when we don't treat those highly infectious spores, particularly the black ones that are very long lasting for five to 10 years, and they get blown with winds onto all surrounding areas. And then the winds and you turning the soils means that that's mixed up. So most garlic infections are caused by prior seasons infections in soils. However, if you don't sterilize, which is external spores on the cloves, it could be transferred uh, if you had spores flying around. So Tira, just a, a, a quick hello. So that's yes, answer that question. We must have walked away. Okay, I've got a question from Jamie saying, I think I have this dehydration in some of my last year's stock. Ah, so that might have been talking about the desiccated cloves that appear from um, dry bulb mites and mites. And the answer is that they are 
so prolific. <laughs> in fact, until I, well, I think I really didn't realize how prolific they were even myself until I started to do a lot more intensive pest and disease monitoring and certainly got my microscope out, which is a wonderful um, you know, digital microscope, and then went, hooly dooly, <laughs> these guys are there. And then as soon as I started using my neem oil and my natural soap treatments, um, the plants were so much healthier. The bulbs lasted beautifully. I just did not have that type of storage spoilage. And to be honest, when you're a commercial grower, you don't really have that issue because your main goal is to sell that stock really quickly to the market and to get the best price. But when you're looking to optimise that long-lasting storage in your home environment, then really dealing with the mites is a fantastic thing. So absolutely go with the mite and the neem oil and the, um, if, if you can, the wood vinegar. I've got a message here from Burn. And Burn, if you're still listening to me, your question was just want to clarify the percentage. So Burn, are you able to take your mute off and just help me understand that question a little bit more? When you say the 2% neem oil and 2% of something else. So you also, mm. um, so in a litre of water, you would put two mil of neem oil and two mil of the other one? Um, so I always work with my measurements of what my container is going to hold. So I'm just okay. going to do my quick math because my containers are going to be 20 litre containers or they're going to be 10 litre yep. or I've got a 50 litre tub. So I start with something that says, let me assume I've got a bowl and let me say it's five litres of yeah. that I've got to put in there. So I'd say 0 0.02 times five litres is okay. 100 mil. Yeah. So that's okay. what I would do. I'd say I've got my five litre container. I need to put in 100 mil of neem oil yeah. and 100 mil of the natural Castile soap. Make sense? Yep, perfect. Excellent. Okay. Um, I've got John is saying, are there any companion plans for garlic, a soil improvers or disease fighting management? Um, the answer would be in a commercial world, and you can do this in a home growing world, we use the off season, so in rotation, we don't actually grow for two seasons out of three. And those two seasons where that soil is not going to be cropped is actually really vital for us to do all of that type of remediation. So we would use, uh, depending on what profile of pests or diseases that we have, we use green manure crops and we'll certainly use particular species in those green manure crops and mixes that can be very beneficial for suppressing or breaking up the type of pest or disease pressure that we've got. So, for example, a green manure crop typically, and this is where we talk about seeds, it's not just a single species. It's typically four different types of seeds. It's going to be a nitrogen fixing legume. It's going to be a deep rooted cereal crop like an Italian rye. Um, it's going to be brassicas, which have a biofumigation potential to them. And it's going to be what we call a C4, which is a carbon building plant that's going to keep persistent carbon in the soil, which is both microbial environment and moisture holding and nutrient holding capacity. So you can do that on a small scale yourself is just put and buy a multi-species green manure seed and put that in at least grow it for at least three months. So you've got a nice little, you know, 20 to 30 centimetres of height, break that up into the soil and chop it into the soil. And when you chop that into soil, you need to allow for at least six to 12 weeks and that's season dependent. So the warmer it is, it's only six weeks to break down. The cooler it is like Tasmania, we need 12 weeks to break it down. And then that does that beautiful rejuvenating and antifungal and microbial enhancing and disease diluting type of impact that we want before we actually put the garlic crop in. John, are you happy with that answer? Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Um, I've got Urn, I know you're not recommending a vodka soak this year, but could you please explain what a vodka treatment actually is? Um, sure, and so in a gentler year, um, vodka, which is an alcohol, it's a 37% alcohol, and as a 37% alcohol, it's incredibly effective, again, at treating bacterial, fungal, and viruses. And a vodka soak, it's in my previous planting guide that I've left up on the website. So if you go to the, the, um, the planting guide, there'll be one for 2023 and then the previous one. And it's a 5% alcohol. So you've got to take a 37% alcohol vodka 
and dilute at one to seven parts, which brings it down to 5% inner water dilution. And then that 5% vodka, you can soak for five minutes and that gives you a gentle externalized uh, sterilization of a, a very pure spirit. So it's not a chemical compound that's going to contaminate your clothes. It's just a very pure white spirit, which has the benefit of being able to really have a sterilization impact, which is a little bit more gentler than the sodium hypochlorate that I'm recommending this year with the bleach. This year, it's all about really knocking. Um, <laughs> Terry, I love your cat. <laughs> It's really about knocking those bacterial diseases off because it, they have become incredibly prevalent. When I see everybody's photographs on Facebook, all I can see is bacterial disease, bacterial disease, bacterial disease, bacterial. And so we've really got to knock those off. And I'm really hoping we're going to have a great couple of years to really recover from these last three years that have been horrible, horrible, rainy, unpredictable years. Un, are you happy with that answer? If you unmute and say hello and happy with that. Yes, okay. thanks. That's terrific. Thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, Sam, where do we get wood vinegar? Uh, look, any biochar company is probably going to start to make wood vinegar now. Um, just go on to Google, do Wood Vinegar Australia, and you'll get about three or four companies that are producing it. And um, it's a distillate, as I said, of the smoke and the condensation of the smoke coming off the biochar system. And it's becoming, and it has actually got a couple of good studies out there that are showing the organic practices and benefits of the antifungal qualities of it. So for those really wanting to follow natural organic practices, it's a good product to have in the back of your pocket to be able to use. So just do a Google search, Wood Vinegar Australia, um, and it just know it's related to the distillate of the condensation of the, the biochar system. Patricia, I've put a link to PyroEgg um, which have been doing it for some years now. I'll put Great. it in the chat. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Terry. All right. Is fluoropyram an organic treatment? Absolutely not, Marty. It's a, a synthetic chemical compound um, and it is a, a very effective compound. If And this is if you're worried about being organic. Um, and Marty, if you can just unmute yourself so I can see you come to the front if you're still wanting to have an answer to this question. So Marty, are you certified organic? No, no. <laughs> and so is this a question about just growing organically, naturally? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll tell you where I go with this, which is that I used to be certified organic. I still try and use really organic practices completely in every way. Um, there are times, though, that if you're doing testing and you find something that's significant that you cannot treat with an organic system, which is completely certified organic, you can take the garlic out of the organic system. I can have, which is what I have now, what I call my treatment beds. And the treatment beds are where I will actually use a small recovery genetic base of garlic, where I will pre-treat them and then grow them out for several seasons in those curative treatment beds. Um, and then once I've got that and got the health and the vigor back up by using a chemical which could only do that type of treatment, then I can actually transfer it to a transitioning bed, which is clean completely, but that's where it's coming out of my you know, chemical treatment beds back into that transition bed. And yep. after one season, those transition beds, it goes back into the organic beds. And yep. it's the way that you can cure something that you can only do with a chemical without contaminating or having to fully treat, you know, your general growing beds. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's a tricky one, but, you know, I love growing organically, but sometimes if you've got something, you just need to treat it. Yeah. Um, if raised beds, do we need to make a ridge? No. If you've got lovely raised beds that are lovely 40 centimetres high and you've got lovely free-draining soils, we don't need to ridge it. That's why you'll never see me ridging in my raised beds because they're already free-draining. In fact, my beds are completely off the ground if you saw the photograph, which means it drains out the bottom of the beds. So, and that's because we've had such really high rainfalls. Um, and Tira also says we're going on to use an, an Asian beneficial microorganism and set like the acid bacteria, purple for synthetic. When should we use that? Pre-planting or after planting, post-planting. And the reason why is your pre-planting treatments 
are all about killing any unwanted pathogen that's on your clove surface. So, you know, all of those bleach products and all of the neem oil products are all about killing those organisms. And, and so you've got this residual effect on your clove, which is really about keeping that, that, that sterilized surface of the clove until you've actually, you know, planted it in the ground. Only when you've planted in the ground, and I actually wait for at least three to five days after planting and it's been raining or I've been irrigating to really wet the soils down, only then do I start to put out my inoculums and my beneficial guys because I don't want to treat that, that sterilized clove and have those organisms die on the surface of the clove because I've actually still got that residual treatment on it. So wait three to five days and then do post-planting inoculation, which is what we were talking about. Can I please ask, would mycelium uh, clean up those diseases? Now, uh, Carol, I'm going to get you to unmute and just make sure that we're answering this. Mycelium is actually the technical term for the hyphal structure created by fungi in general. Yes. It's not, not specific to a biocontrol at all. No, um, just, just when you grow mushrooms, the yes. mycelium roots below, below the circle so surface, I know they're very good at cleaning up, or some of them are very good at cleaning up nematodes, root nematodes. Yes, yes. I, I'm wondering if maybe they would help with some of the diseases as well. So in my slide that I had my post-planting biocontrols and inoculations, I had a list of things that I used. And one of them is called nematophagous fungi, and that is fungi, fungal species that intentionally target nematodes. And that's exactly what you're talking about. So this is using very specific organisms that are known to target nematodes. Yeah. I also use cordyceps, which is a fungal organism that will target soil mites. Yeah. Um, and I also use trichodermas, and there's a range of trichoderma species. And that's a fungal organism that will also target other fungal pathogens. So absolutely, there are very specific, we call them biocontrols. And yeah. those biocontrols could be bacterial, they could be fungal but those biocontrols are specific species of organisms that have been recognized for their very active function in the soil for either suppressing disease or actively targeting those organisms. Cool, thanks. Okay. So would one, would one mushroom um, variety do all three or you really no. do, you do <laughs> need several? Unfortunately, our oyster mushrooms or our, our mushroom compost that we're talking about are really about edible organisms. And those mushroom mycelium is not going to be particularly effective as disease suppressors or in targeting organisms, so targeting pathogens. Um, so these are commercial inoculums that we can purchase from very um, professional companies that produce and source these commercially produced targeted controls. Okay. And you're, you're buying them from, and in fact, they're available in smaller quantities, but probably not home quantities from Nutritech Solutions is a wonderful company that's starting to make much more retail available products. Um, organic Crop Productants is another, Protectants is another company that does a lot of the biocontrols. Um, so there's a range of companies now where 20 years ago, there was very few. And now we have quite a few companies with very reputable quality production or sourcing of these commercial inoculums. Good. Thank you. Thanks heaps for that. You're welcome. Um, Susan Stahl says, I lost last year's crop to rust. What do I do to be able to make that bed to reuse that bed? Mm. So rust was probably uh, <laughs> um, ubiquitous across all um, garlic producing areas last year. And even myself, I had garlic rust in the turbines. And whilst my turbines were planted, you know, 100 metres away from the rest of my garlic, those horrendous winds that we had, because it was raining continuously. For me, it was raining six and a half days. How do you get a garlic rust treatment out when it's raining? You know, how do you get it persistent on the leaves when it's raining? Um, even if you can put a systemic product out, it's got to have time to dry and get absorbed in the leaves. So when it's continuously raining, you can't do anything with it. It was almost like tearing your hair out last year. Um, so the best thing that I do is one of the things is that by putting my mulches on immediately, it's stopping any soil-borne spores from splashing up in the rain onto the plant. 
So a mulch is actually an incredibly effective suppressor of, of when what we call soil borne rust um, particles and spores are normally splashed onto the underside of the leaf from rainfall or from watering. So um, you know, putting a good mulch on is actually going to suppress that in. The second thing is that we are rotating. So by, by, being, by being able to rotate and maintain a really good organic compost in those soils with other future crops coming in, those spores will actually be eaten by a lot of the arthropods. They're the little tiny microscopic insects in the soils that are responsible for breaking up all of the organic matter and leaf tissue and compost that you're putting in. They're actually sought out as, as a spore source. And what we call with garlic rust, you'll probably have noticed that the garlic rust will come in the orange pustule, which is the highly infectious reproductive spore, but that actually has a fairly short lifespan in the soil of only two to three years. It's the black one that when it gets really dry at the end of the garlic rust season, you can see those black spores on the leaves and they're the ones that can persist for five to 10 years. So it really means that we, for me, I removed every skerrick of organic matter, which was from those garlic leaves that was on the bed, you know, the dead ones. I removed all of that because I don't want the soils to be infected. And then I certainly was continually treating with new manures and new composts and making sure those beneficial microorganisms are in there to keep that biological activity going to really degrade a lot of those spores. And then when you do come back to that, really mulch it thickly with a good three to four centimetres of that mulch to stop those soil borne spores from splashing up. And that means stopping the chickens digging in it, stopping the dogs and the cats digging in it, you know, stopping the wallabies from digging in it because exposed soils, and even when you weed and take the weeds out, recover it up with the mulch so that you really aren't seeing exposed soils that, that, that rust spores can splash into the underleaves. Okay, great, Susan, thank you. Um, Pre-planting fertilizers, uh, check session number one, watch the video. Not gonna go back to that one, that was done in session number one. A Pratt Sharma, can I please confirm three minute bleach, then rinse thoroughly and then soak for 24 hours in neem oil solution and plant. That's exactly what I do. So I go straight away three minutes into my bleach. I'm timing it. I've got my little timer come out of my bleach because I normally have it into my netting bag and it goes straight over into my neem oil tub. And it doesn't matter if it's in there for 25 hours or 26 hours, it really doesn't. It's just get it in there and then leave it in there so it can saturate and penetrate through. But yes, straight away. And then the next day I came in, I take them all out of my neem oil tub, I drain them into a bucket so they're just draining there and then I take them out and plant them straight away. I don't wanna leave them sitting around. Your worst thing you could do is let wet cloves sit around before you get them into the soil. So do plant them away uh, quickly. Do you use weed gunnel? Um, oh gosh, no, I don't. Um, I used it in the commercial sense when I went from an organic mulch in certified organics and I used weed gunnel um, during commercially. I found even in Tasmania that it overheated my soils and that it had a tendency to uh, create greater levels of certain diseases in my harvests. Um, and through the trials, I found if I covered the weed gunnel in a bit of organic mulch, it certainly reduced the overheating of the soil and the risk of pest and disease. Um, but I do find in general, in a warmer climate, the weed gunnel really needs to be removed as soon as you are getting around the 25 degree days. So you could use it initially to do your planting in. It'll give you great winter suppression. It'll give you great early spring suppression. But uh, in temperature testing, which is what I've done to work out what an ambient temperature of 25 does, that immediately underneath that black fabric, it's about 55 to 65 degrees centigrade. And then down at five centimetres, which is where your stem is and your basal plate is, it could still actually be upwards of nearing 30 degrees centigrade. And that's just way, way too hot for garlic. Um, so up to you. I generally don't recommend now weed gunnel. I use it as a lining in my boxes. I don't use it on top of my planting beds. Thanks, um, Megan. Megan. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, Megan's here. Um, so some growers are artificially fertilizing their garlic to enable them to plant them very early. Uh, could you encourage secondary shooting? Oh my gosh, why would you fertilize and then plant early? Um, 
So there's a, it's a really good question. It's a little bit complex question. So very quickly to answer that one. Artificially vernalizing is trying to do what winter does. So garlic needs and different garlic groups need different levels of chill hours. And we're very familiar with chill hours because we talk about fruit trees needing certain degrees of chill hours to be able to grow properly. And garlic does. And the different garlic groups actually need different levels of chill hours. And that chill hours is really coming through winter growing. So if you've got a cold garlic group that's going in Tasmania, you know, we're getting five to six months of overnight temperatures that are below 10 degrees and sometimes below five degrees. And our daytimes could be sitting around five to eight degrees. So the level of vernalization, i.e. in brackets, chill hours, is completely satisfied by our normal climatic factors. Um, there are some growers who may be in warmer climates like northern New South Wales trying to grow what we call a slightly cooler climate garlic where a garlic would want to have and we'll throw a figure at it they'll want to have 10 weeks of sub 10 degrees overnights and their climate will only give them six weeks of sub 10 degree overnights so it's not getting the full chill hours that it would want and you can artificially, in terms of putting it into a cool room um, or a cold room, and it's, there's different effects for the temperature range, but you could artificially help that garlic to accumulate a certain number of those chill hours by keeping it into a refrigerator, cool room or a cold room. And what that does is that it actually then reduces its expectations of what it's trying to get during winter. But what it can do, and it does do really poorly, is that it can shorten the growth cycle of a plant. So normally a plant would grow easily for, depending on the garlic group, it's going to grow for about five and a half months up to nine months. By artificial vernalizing, you might reduce the period of planting to bulbing from technically nearly 200 days. You could reduce that down to 95 days. And when you do that, you have a much smaller plant and that plant is then advanced in its growing to the point that it now could trigger and be triggered in the unstable spring condition. It could be triggered into secondary shooting. But I, Megan, if you're there, I'm not sure why you would want to artificially vernalize and then plant early, because that would definitely mean that with that advanced shorter growing period of the plant, that it would be trying to bulb in an earlier spring period, which would make it very susceptible to secondary shooting. Uh, that's precisely what I was uh, thinking, because as I said, I've right. seen some, <laughs> uh, some growers have been advocating, oh, plant early to miss the rust of spring, but um, without going into specifics, I'm pretty sure that people who have followed that advice have found that they've had a greater incidence of secondary shooting. Yeah. And so I'm the opposite. So for me, I've definitely been advocating for particularly people who are in what we call a really cold, wet, overcast spring period. Um, I actually advocate for people to plant very later in their growing cycles because really the, only, the garlic's really what we call a winter crop, but it's only function before winter technically is to put out roots and to put out its photosynthetic leaves. And so if we can keep it more juvenile in the early spring period, which is when it's really wet and really overcast and cold, which is garlic rust conditions, garlic rust equals 12 to 22 degrees temperature, and it equals greater than four hours of leaf wetness, that's garlic rust conditions. So if we can keep it juvenile, oh, and balding, so if we can keep it juvenile during those periods of where it's really cool, wet and overcast, and we can have it maturing after that in late spring when it's warmer and it's drier, so it's above 22 degrees, or if we don't have periods of four hours of leaf wetness, then we have less rust risk. And rust risk occurs when the bulb has a compromised immune system, which is when it is bulbing. So if we can plant it later, which means it's maturing later, then the, the risk of garlic rust is greatly reduced. So I would think the recommendation would be the complete opposite. Plant later, mature later, less risk of rust. Great, thanks. Welcome. Okay. Um, uh, Katerina. Katerina is saying, do we soak in white king first and then in Nemo for 24 hours? Yes. 
Um, and I think, I think we've spoken about that one. Wood vinegar, thank you for the link. Um, okay, so look, I'm just going to hold us there. I'm going to um, turn the recording off because I think we've reached the end and we've certainly run over a bit of time. For those people who would like to leave, thank you so much for attending tonight. I hope you've got value out of it and it's hope it's illuminated you know, new information and new practices that you might use. For those who have other questions or want to stay on for the discussion, hold two while I just actually finish the recording. Um, and I'll try and get the recording up onto the website for those who haven't attended or want to rewatch it um, by tomorrow night, just time pending. But thank you, everybody, for attending. And stay on if you would like to ask any more questions after the recording is finished. So thank you again. Let me just finish the recording.